we got signed to a record deal. And I went home and I told my mom, we got signed to a record deal. You know, basically, look, mom, we did it. I got a job, you know. And she was like, wow, that's great, baby. You know, how much do you make at your job? And I was kind of like, well, we make eight points. And she said, well, how much is eight points worth? And I said, you know what, mom, let me go find out. Cause you, that's, that's a good question. Let me go and ask somebody. So I go and I say, listen, I understand when I cut somebody's grass and they say we're going to pay you $100 to cut the grass, I know how much I'm making. Right. I understand if I go into business with you and we're going to cut grass and we say we're going to split it 50-50 and I know somebody gives me $100, I know how much I'm making. When someone comes up to you and says, I'm going to pay you eight points, you have no idea what does that equal up to. So when I'm kind of like, hey, so how much is a point? And it was kind of like, uh, well, it can be described, it can be a bunch of different things. And it's kind of like, well, okay, like what? Like I'm trying to figure out how much is a point. And it was just like, you're a troublemaker. And I'm like, wait a minute, you know, I'm the farthest person from a troublemaker. I'm just trying to get some clarity on how much am I making at my job? And now I'm deemed a troublemaker. You pacified me enough that I stopped asking you, but I never got a straight answer. Like, I don't have a straight answer today. We were in the studio one time working on an album. And it was funny because the record company had producers and one of the in-house producers realized, like, he was just looking at my gear, you know, and he was like, you're really into this, huh? And I was like, yeah, you know, I had all kinds of keyboards and drum machines. And he said, if anyone knew that I told you this, I could be fired. But what I suggest that you do, he said, how much, how much is your budget? How much is your recording budget? And I said, $250,000. And he said, you should take $100,000 of your recording budget and buy yourself a mixing board and buy yourself a tape machine and record your own stuff. You may not mix it, but record it because if it may cost you twenty dollars to $30,000 to mix it, put all of that money back in your pocket because now you own the studio. When you looked at it, the record label owned a recording studio that gave you a very good deal on recording your album. So if they give you a $250,000, $300,000 budget, then they say, hey, well, we have a really good studio for you to record in. And you're like, okay, cool. And they give you a really good rate. Then they're taking some of that money back. The record label owned an equipment rental company. So if there was equipment that you wanted to use for your record that you didn't own, you can rent it. And then they're taking more money. So it's almost one of, to me, it's good business that if I give you this money, I'm giving you services that you're giving the money right back. If you have your own studio and they give you the money, you pay yourself for recording your album. You treat yourself like you are your own business. The record label found out that I had a studio. They came down to see it. And I know that this was one of those things. Like, we don't know if you got this little room with a four-track recorder and you're just trying to get extra money. And it wasn't until they came down and looked and saw, like, wow, you really put together a full-fledged studio. When we first signed to our label, our label was in an apartment building. It was in a brownstone in New, in New York City. Um, didn't really have a bunch of artists. You know, we sold a bunch of records and a bunch of the other acts that they had, they sold records. And the record label got really, really successful that it moved to Midtown Manhattan in a high rise. And we knew, you know, that we had something to do with that. We weren't solely responsible for that. But we knew with the records and the success that we had that that helped the record label grow. The last time that Will and I went to go visit our label, we waited in the lobby for an hour. When they don't think that you can contribute anymore, they, they, they treat you different. I can look around at the walls and see what we contributed. I don't really have a long list of what you contributed. You know, especially not financially. When Will got the TV show, we debuted a song on the television show. No one in history has ever done that. 
you know, we debuted a song and a video on a primetime slot at the end of a television show, of a top 10 TV show. When it was all said and done, the record label said that our extracurricular activities were interfering with us making music. Throughout my career, I had to sometimes take a step back and realize that what got me into this in the first place is my love for music. I used to ride to the block parties and watch these DJs put these massive sound systems up and I would just sit on my bike and I wouldn't dance, I wouldn't socialize. All I wanted to do is watch this DJ play music and affect people, make people happy. Like, and I wanted to be that guy. Like I thought it was so important that through these records and through this music, he could change people's attitudes and emotions. And that's what I got into it for. Um, and sometimes you get tainted and you lose sight because of the, the, the issues in the music business that you have to stop and ask yourself, what was your reason for getting into this in the first place? And it was really for the love of music. What I realized is through all of my ups and down journeys, you know, in the music business, music has never treated me bad. Music has never done me wrong. I have no reason to be mad at music. My anger and displeasure is with the music business. There's a lot of artists out that are being held hostage by their record labels. You can't really put out music when you want to. Um, there's, a, there's a thing that the record company basically have their hand on a fan switch that in order to get to your fan base, they only cut their fan switch on when it's time for you to put out a product. And as soon as your product starts to die down, they cut that off. But there are so many artists that are held hostage because the record label really wants you to be 100% solely dependent on them. And we were one of the only few artists that I realized that we got to the end of our contract. We got to the last album and we sat down and basically told them that we wanted to go our separate ways. You know, we had a 10 year run. We all have achieved a bunch of success and we wanted to go do other things. And they said that that was the first time that anyone has ever sat down and approached them, probably because most people don't ever get to the end of their record deal. When most people reach the end of their time at their job, they're greeted with a watch, a cake, a congratulations, a thank you for your service. And when we reached the end of ours, we got greeted with a lawsuit. When you sell a million copies, the first thing that the record label does is they give you a plaque. They give you a trophy. They give you a trinket to say congratulations for selling a million records. But they don't give you a check. Artists used to fight to go platinum. That was a badge of honor. I'm platinum. The structure was set up to pacify you and then to think back at how much importance we put on these plaques that we all talked about. He went gold, he went platinum, he went double platinum. If you went double platinum, you didn't just want your double platinum plaque, you wanted your gold plaque and your platinum plaque and your double platinum plaque. I stood in front of a whole lot of plaques and never once really thought about, I never got a check for these. I sold a million records and I got a plaque. They sold the main records and they got a $10 million check and a plaque. I just got a plaque. In the hindsight, when you think about it, the plaques are just a distraction away from the money. The government's dead. The government's dead. You come for my money and I'm going to come for your head. In today's marketplace, when you really think about it, if you sold 10,000 records on a major label, you were a colossal failure. If you sold 100,000 records on a major label, you were a failure. 
ten dollars a record as an independent artist. If you sold ten thousand records, you made a hundred thousand dollars. If you sold a hundred thousand records, you made a million dollars. So think about it from a major label's perspective. For every hundred thousand records that an artist sold, that was a failure. You just made the record company a million dollars. For an independent artist, that's a pretty successful career. We didn't have to deal with segregation and and the things that my mom and my grandmother dealt with. It's the exact same thing in the music business. That there are kids now that are making music in their room, and they put it out on the internet, and people get it and people love it. They have never had to go through the record industry structure. That they're 100% independent. They're free. They're selling merch. They're doing meet and greets. They have their entire career in their hands, which I'm just happy and blessed to have gone through what I've gone through to be able to be here. Like right now is a beautiful time. How bad the music industry or how bad the game is right now. But if you talk to that 16-year-old kid who made something in his room. They're standing on a stage at a stadium with millions of people loving what he does because he put it out on the internet. This is the best time in the world to be in the music industry. So I'm happy to be able to see both. If you don't hear my cries, then fuck you. Understand I'ma stand with mine and I'ma maintain my composure throughout all the bullshit that you gonna put me through. I'ma harvest all my 40 acres in a mule and turn that into a beautiful big tree that you can't fuck with. Don't come for my apples, don't come for none of my shit. I'm ready to die for the fruit of my labor. You heard me? I can in my hotel room, make a piece of music, I can upload it, and I can go on social media and tell all of my fans, all of the people that like what I do, hey, I'm about to drop something in 10 minutes. Go to X place and download it. And they have it. You could not do that with a record company. You didn't have that access. That changes the playing field because now you have the ability to put out the music that you want and you have access to all of the people that like what you do. This shift is what actually took the power away from the record labels because now the artist has direct access to his fans. They can talk to him whenever they want. I can I can talk to my fans about the football game on Sunday. I can talk to my fans and tell my fans that I'm on my way to a particular city. You know, there's been millions of times that I tweeted that I was on my way to a city and landed in the airport and it was 30 people in the airport waiting for pictures and asking me to sign stuff. And that access is paramount when you're trying to put out music. Once the power got back in the artist's hands and that they had a relationship with their fans and had a relationship that they could release music when and how they wanted to, the music industry had no choice but to follow suit. One thing that I've always said, you can put out music without a record label, but a record label can't put out music without an artist. I'm loving all the feels whenever I'm with you. You know I do, yeah, yeah. You're doing everything just right. People ask, why did it take you 11 years to put out another album. I couldn't put out an album under an old antiquated record system. I couldn't put out an album that you wouldn't be fairly compensated. I couldn't put out an album that I could not give my fan base the music that I wanted to give them in in the manner that I wanted to give them. So there was no way that I could put out an album under a record label structure unless it was my own. It took me 11 years to put out an album because I was waiting for the industry to catch up with me. This album is a reflection of the Magnificent trilogy. I've always designed the Magnificent to be a three-part series. Not that I'm not gonna put out any more music, I just wanted to end the Magnificent series. So this is a reflection of 11 years later, being a little bit more mature, 
being 100% independent. It's kind of like graduation. I feel like I'm graduating um, to, to be able to do something that you have made all of the decisions from beginning to end, what the cover looks like, how the mix sounds, the artist that you chose, down to the release date, videos. It's a freedom that I have never had and it's a freedom that I will never lose again. I am not mad, I'm not bitter at all. I am sitting on a balcony in Malta. I didn't even know where Malta was. I just came from Kenya. I'm going to Paris tomorrow. I'm not mad, I'm not mad at all. Like, I'm not saying any of this stuff out of anger. I'm saying it because I made it through and I just wanna make sure that the next person doesn't have to go through what I went through. I figured it out. And I just don't want to have the next generation to have to figure it out. If I can tell them how to get around those potholes that I fell in, then that's my job. Understand that it's not like it was before. The longevity in this business is really, really hard to achieve, especially, you know, when it comes to uh, hip hop or even just the music business. You get a lot of young artists that are hot right now, that are spending so much money because they think it's gonna last forever. I'm living testimony to let you know that it doesn't. There's a handful of people that make it to the 10 year club. There's a very small handful of people that make it to the 20 year club. And the 30 year club is very thin. I realize how blessed I am, but I also look at a lot of my peers that have let the issues in the music industry completely shut them down. And at the end of the day, at music, has never done me wrong. I think I look at the darkest moments that I had in the music industry and then I look out at a view like this and I understand that it was perseverance that got me here. It was realizing that through all of the stuff that happened, music was the most important thing. If you're given a gift to create, you should create no matter what. I'm pretty sure that Picasso didn't paint every picture because somebody was paying him to. If he saw a view like this, he painted it because it was beautiful, not because somebody gave him a check. And I just think if you kind of keep that kind of grounding, then it all works out. I just want to help recreate the music business. They call it a game for a reason. I'm just trying to figure out a new way to play.